when we kind of like get further in our life journey, life happens. We get busy, we get distracted, we get stressed out, whether it's family stress, emotional stress, financial stress, work stress. I mean, this is modern society we live in. All those things affect how we eat, the decision, the choices we eat, how much we exercise, how physically active we are, how much sleep we get. And stress itself, by the way, causes inflammation, uh, which can actually impact our metabolism as well. So uh, not surprisingly, as we kind of get into our later years and kind of mid to life, you know, it, it's sort of a lifestyle issue that tends to sit on our metabolism, but that actually gives us the agency to be able to deliberately look at those pieces of our life that we can improve. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Today, I'm joined again by one of my very first guests on this show and one of my favorites to date, Dr. William Lee. He's here to talk about his new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. Dr. Lee is an internationally renowned physician, scientist, president, and medical director of the Angiogenesis Foundation. In our first interview, we discussed his New York Times bestseller, Eat to Beat Disease, the new science of how your body can heal itself. He's back again today to discuss this very book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, Burn Fat, Heal Your Metabolism, and Live Longer. It will be out this March 21st, 2023. Now, before we get started, I've got to share that disclaimer. When we dig into the science of health and nutrition, it's imperative to remember that this show is offered for informational purposes only. If you have specific health concerns, you'll want to connect with your healthcare provider. With that, let's get him right up here. Dr. William Lee, welcome to the show. Hi, Corinna. Thank you for having me back. It's so good to have you here. Now, I know you've been very busy with your masterclass, with the courses you offer, and also with this book. I'm personally loving it. It is the anti-diet diet book solution. So just to prepare our audience for this work, I would love for you to quickly summarize the five health defenses and then talk about what inspired you to double down and create this book. Yeah, my first book, Eat to Beat Disease, I was writing about food and health, which we're all interested in. And what I wrote about is that when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food. It's about how our body responds to what we actually put inside it. When we put good food inside it, we're actually able to, our body responds by activating health defenses. And there are five of them. I'll tell you about them. Five health defenses. The first one is angiogenesis, which is how our body grows blood vessels. We've got 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels to bring oxygen and all the nutrients that we eat to every cell in our body. Second health defense is our stem cells. We actually regenerate and rejuvenate from the inside out. Third is our gut microbiome, which as we all know, helps with our gut health. But very importantly, our gut health actually helps our mental wellness, uh, our mood, helps us heal from the inside and lowers inflammation. Third health defense is our DNA. Much more than a genetic code, our DNA protects us from harms in the environment like ultraviolet radiation or radon from the ground. And of course, harmful chemicals that we might eat in our food. And then finally, our health defense, fifth health defense is our immune system, which is much more powerful than we ever thought. Not only does a strong immunity protect us from invaders from the outside like bacteria and viruses, but it also protects us from invaders inside our body like cancer cells. So what I wrote in my first book is that foods can actually activate these health defenses to help us raise our shields. And when I was done with the book, I asked myself, where do you go next? And mm -hmm. that's what Eat to Beat Your Diet about. It is actually a sequel that says, from wherever you are, how do you get to that next level? If you're good, how do you get to great? And that's how you eat to, to improve your metabolism. That's where the answer lies. Now, in a quick review of the book, you dive into fats and some myths that we still need to work to dispel about fats, about white adipose tissue versus brown fat about how these fats can actually impact our hormones and dictate our health and even how our metabolism works. 
So let's dive into the research a bit. What is it that you've really found through this journey? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think all of us who are uh, walking around and listening and watching this have the same experience, which is we ha- we associate body fat with something unpleasant. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, all of us have, have had this experience. You step out of the shower, out of the corner of your eye, you see the reflection in the mirror, and there might be a lump or a bump that you're not happy with, right? Mm-hmm. And so immediately then you step on the scale and you start to curse body fat and you blame your metabolism. I mean, this is such a common scenario. Yes. And yet I'm a scientist. So I want to actually understand better. Where does fat come from? Fat doesn't just appear in your body. Um, and actually, by the way, if you take a look at babies, healthy babies are chubby babies, right? They've got big chubby cheeks. They've got um, uh, big tummies and they've, their arms and legs are like those uh, circus balloons that the clowns make little poodles out of, right? They're, they're chubby. And so fat in a baby is really, really good. So where does fat come from? Well, I'll tell you, when the mom's egg met the dad's sperm and they turn into a ball of cells, okay, this is in the uterus, um, the first cell, the first tissue that forms is the circulation because every organ that forms will need to have a blood supply. Second tissue that forms are your nerves because every organ eventually will need to have instructions coming through the wiring of our nervous system to tell it what to do. Third tissue that forms is body fat. Body fat forms in little cells called adipocytes. The adipocyte is, means tiny fat cell. And guess what? The fat forms around our blood vessels like bubble wrap. You know, a sheet of bubble wrap that goes around your blood vessels? And the reason it does this is because body fat adipocytes are fuel tanks for um, the food that we eat that get, goes into our bloodstream that are later on going to be stored as energy into our fuel tank. So our metabolism can help our body do its thing. And so the fact that we need fat even before we're born, I mean, I always tell people jokingly, look, we all had fat before we had a face that we could stuff with food. So stop blaming the food. (laughs) Let's just think about what it is that our body fat actually does for us. And this is the big discovery. Body fat has at least four unsuspected functions. All right. Um, We used to think that fat is kind of like a insulation, like blubber, Okay, like in a whale, but actually that's not the case. Our fat is kind of a cushion. And thank goodness we have it because if we didn't have body fat, if we slipped on a rug and fell on the floor, our organs would burst open. Okay, so goodness, good thing we actually have good body fat as a cushion. Second, our um, our body fat uh, uh, actually remarkably uh, is a uh, hormonal organ. Okay, it's an endocrine organ. An endocrine organ is like your thyroid, your adrenal glands, your ovaries, your testicles. They they make hormones. And it turns out that fat, our body fat, adipose tissue, okay, which is very normal, forms in the womb, all right, secretes hormones, all right? Now, what are the hormones they secrete normally to help our metabolism? They secrete at least 15 of them. One of them is called leptin. Hmm. Leptin, sometimes known as a satiety hormone, which means fullness. I like to think about it not as an off and on switch. I think about it as a volume switch. When you turn the volume up with leptin, yeah, less, less, not, not so hungry. Turn it down, yeah, getting kind of hungry. All right. Um, another hormone that your body fat, normal, healthy body fat secretes is called adiponectin. It's, a, it's just the name of a hormone. However, this hormone is very, very important. So, Karina, if I actually, uh, as a doctor, asked you to draw a tube of blood that I sent to the hospital lab to measure all of the hormones in your body, okay? Um, Your cortisol, your thyroid, your adiponectin. I'll tell you that adiponectin will be 1,000 times higher than every other hormone in your body. Wow. Surprise. And the reason is because our healthy fat makes adiponectin. Adiponectin works with our insulin in order to help our metabolism draw energy from the blood to store it into the fuel tanks. So the only reason that we have energy is because we eat food and the food provides the fuel in our body, just like uh, going to the filling station, a gas station to put fill up your tank. And in order for the uh, your body to absorb that fuel, we need a diponectin collaborating, partnering with insulin to draw that fuel in. Okay, a thousand times higher than any other hormone because that's how important our energy is. 
That's normal healthy fat with our our metabolism. Um, another hormone, by the way, if if adiponectin is the gas gas pedal to help us absorb fuel more efficiently and faster, then another hormone is called resistin, hmm. and resistin is like the brake. So think about it: you're getting onto you're driving on a highway, get into the fast lane. Time to push the adiponectin, more energy, more fuel. Not, not so fast as the car ahead. Now you hit resistance, slow down. Not so fast. This wow, is how see, these hormones actually work. And the reason I wanted to stop here for a second is because this was the first time I actually heard about resistance. I had done some reading on things like resolvins, which support res resolution of inflammation, protectins, which protect and support your DNA and how omega-3s and omega-3 source fats like EPA and DHA impact those systems. And so when I learned about this new one, my, my big question comes up, is there a connection between the types of fats we consume and this particular um, action in the body? So what, what we're talking about, these hormonal uh, uh, factors, uh, absolutely functioned like the operating system in your laptop. When you got your laptop from the computer store and you started it up, it's hardwired to do its thing. And so these hormonal functions are hardwired from the time we're born all the way to our very last breath to do its thing. Hmm. One of the um, startling things that I write about is a the most ambitious human a study of human metabolism undertaken in history that was just published two years ago that showed that all humans only go through four phases of metabolism over this the course astonishing. of our life. I, I'm so yeah. glad you're talking about this because, I mean, I read this section of your book and I was like, whoa, mind blown. So yes, tell yeah. us about those four phases. And I'll tell you how it links up to your question about how the fat we is. Yes, what we eat and, and, when, and how we eat and when we eat all affect our metabolism in different ways and can influence our hormones. But it's what's really important to understand how we're wired. What is our operating system like? And, you know, when I wrote, when I wrote, started to write Eat to Beat Your Diet, I wanted to write about metabolism and not dieting. In fact, the title itself, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is a trick title. It's not a diet book. It's an anti-diet book, as you said, because it's really about how do we actually, what's, what do we know today about our metabolism based on the new science of the metabolism that this that really upends the myths that we all walk around with, right? People say, oh, you're either born with a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism. That's why some people um, are skinny as a stick and don't have to worry about their food. And other people, you know, are battling with their weight over their lives and they always need to worry about what they what they eat. I can tell you that there's it's not the metabolism doing that. Um, another myth is that, you know, when kids are growing up uh, in teenage years and they're eating two dinners and bouncing off the walls, that their metabolism is going sky high. Also a myth. Another big myth um, is that when you reach middle age, whether you're a man or a woman, your 40s and 50s, of course, then you get to your 60s, your metabolism naturally slows down, which is why many people are struggling with their weight uh, when they actually reach middle age. Also, not true based on how our metabolism is hardwired. And so I'll explain to you how we discovered that these are all myths. About two years ago, a paper appeared in the journal Science, a mind-blowing paper because Science is um, uh, one of the most prestigious scientific journals that they really talk about discoveries, like fundamental discoveries, mind-blowing, game-changing, you know, human advancement kinds of discoveries. And this was a study that was published. A researcher named Herman Ponzer worked with 90 other collaborators. This is a big research study, and they came from 20 different countries all around the world, and they studied metabolism in 6,000 people. That's a big study. What's really remarkable, they studied the people all in exactly the same way. They gave them a drink of water, H2O, and what they did is they were able to uh, chemically tweak the H, which is hydrogen, in water. H is hydrogen, and O, the O in H2O is oxygen. They tweaked it a little bit so they could measure, after you drink the water, what your metabolism does to those atoms. They could measure metabolism in the breath. They could measure it in the blood. They could measure it in urine. And so they measured the metabolism of 6,000 people, um, but that's not all. They, they, the, of the 6,000 people, they studied people that were two days old, babies, newborns, gave them a drink of water. OK, and study their metabolism. And they also studied people that were 90 plus years old. Wow, that's the 
last chapter of life, and so and everyone in between. So this study, in exactly the same way, studied metabolism across the human lifespan. When they got the results initially, what they found was that everybody had a different metabolism. It was all over the map, just like you would expect, right? <laughs> but what they did is then, you know, we now live in the era of supercomputing, all right, where we can crunch a lot of data. And what they did is they developed an algorithm where they could actually go into every individual result and correct for the size of the, of the subject so they could remove the effect on metabolism of excess body fat. They could remove that. And when they removed it from the two day, from the two day old and the 20 year old and a 40 year old and a 60 year old and a 90 year old removed all the effects of excess body fat. And what, what they, the result they found was like pulling the cloak off the statue of David for the first time. What they found was literally stunning. All humans only go through four phases of metabolism. And here they are. We're all born with exactly the same metabolism at day zero. First year of life is phase one. Our metabolism rockets like a spaceship goes high, sky high to 50% higher than what we're going to be. Our metabolism is when we're an adult. Phase two, from one year old to 20 years old, our metabolism goes down, 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 down. This is right through teenage years, right through adolescence, right through spotting of a bean spot, eating two, three dinners. Metabolism is <laughs> going down to, to uh, adult levels, phase two. Phase three, 20 years old, um, your metabolism 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Metabolism is rock solid. Our metabolism is hardwired to uh, not change one bit between 20 and 60, okay? And what that means that's so stunning is that 60 can be the new 20 if you allow your metabolism to do what it's designed to do, our operating system. And then wow. finally, fourth phase, from 60 onwards to 90, you have a slight decrease in your metabolism, about 17%. So when you're 90, okay, if you're lucky enough to live to be 90, your metabolism will be about 17% of what it was when you were 60, which should be what it was when you're 20. So the question is, why do people have different metabolisms? So they could add the effect of fat back into the system. And you know what they found? It's not that the metabolism that you are born with is your destiny to grow fat and gain weight. It's the other way around. When you add the effect of body fat back to these four patterns, extra body fat crushes your metabolism. So it's not that a slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat. It's body fat crushes your metabolism, slows your metabolism. That means that uh, the good news is that means is that we actually have the power to unleash our inner metabolism, our operating system. We can clean up, you know, it's sort of like on, on your laptop, you know, you have an operating system, you got glitchy screens because you got viruses on it. So you got to clean the virus. We can clean our metabolism up by fighting harmful body fat unleashing who we actually are inside. That to me is really the secret to elevating our health, improving our metabolism. And at the same time, it also improves our health defenses. So there's a couple of things that this drew me to think about just from the prior knowledge I came to your book with. One of which was that we essentially build the same number of fat cells that we'll have by the time that we're really toddlers throughout our adult life right? And then we actually start producing new fat cells in our later life, starting around age 60. So I wonder, just as I was reading through this, what the correlation might be. I know this is brand new research, but I wondered if this was something that you had put any thought into, because essentially, yes, our fat cells kind of create more of a situation where we can become more fat, but those fat cells are essentially the same number, they're just getting bigger, they're swelling, they're creating more space, they're they're taking on more. So, so how do we potentially look at this whole picture and then help people actually get to the point where they can say, okay, well, I can reduce my body fat weight, my body fat percentage, and, and start to turn on this thermogenic capacity of my body's natural metabolism again. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's just dive right in by trying to explain metabolism in a way that anyone can understand. Okay. Even though it's very state of the art. So here's the deal. Um, most of us have a car. We drive a car. We don't think about the fuel and the process of getting energy to the engine so we can get our way. We just get in a car and we drive it. Right. So, um, uh, but our car runs on fuel. And in the same way, our body 
is an engine that our metabolism uses fuel to run our engine. So we can go about our way. We don't normally think about our metabolism. We just do. We just go. Okay. Now back to the car for a second. Think about it. We don't think about the energy in our car until we check the gas, the fuel gauge. If we see the fuel going on empty, what do we do? We pull over to the filling station, to the gas station, take the pump out of the nozzle, put it into the gas, uh, uh, the, the gas tank. We push the container, that gas comes out, fills up the tank. The go goes click, it stops, and we put it back and we drive off, right? In our body, it's the same way, okay? Although we don't actually have a fuel gauge that you can actually see like in a car, our organs and our brain does continuously monitor the amount of fuel in our body that our metabolism uses in order to be able to keep us, our, our operating system functioning. Okay. Now when our fuel gauge in our body runs low, we don't pull over to the filling station. We pull over to the dinner table. We pull over to the refrigerator. We pull over to the pantry. We go to the restaurant. Okay. And, and that's basically what we do now, just like a car filling up the station. When we reach over for food and we put food into our body, that our food provides our fuel, our metabolism takes that fuel and powers up all of our cells. So one of the things that happens is that um, uh, we, when you put food in your mouth, your pancreas releases a substance called insulin. It's a hormone. Insulin actually works with the adiponectin, which your normal healthy fat makes, right? They partner together and they're basically saying, okay, let's go draw that fuel from the food into our cells. Remember I told you that fat originally starts uh, like bubble wrap around blood vessels. When you eat, it goes, the food, the fuel goes into your blood. And now your metabolism is able to take it, your insulin and your adiponectin can take that fuel from the bloodstream and pack it into, give, first of all, give your body the fuel it needs. However, anything extra gets packed into those tiny little fat cells. So as you say, um, most of us are born with most of the fat we're gonna always have. Uh, uh, and what happens is that a single fat cell can expand about a hundred times in size. So when you've got extra fuel, you're going to store it up into the fat cells. It gets bigger, 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 bigger. Okay. And then it's kind of stretched thin. Good thing you're not eating too much because your, your tank is full. Now, uh, uh, now you can kind of go about your way when you're done eating. Now in a car, back to the car for a second, when you fill the, fill the tank at the very end, when the tank is full, the clicker goes and no more gas comes out, right? But can you imagine what would happen if there was no stopper, there was no click at the end of the of the gas pump? What would happen? Your tank would fill up, would overflow very quickly, run down the side of the car, run the tires, pool around your feet, and then you'd be standing in a dangerous, flammable, toxic mess, all right? You'd have to back away, wait for the air to evaporate the gasoline. It'd be very dangerous to be in there, okay? Now, in when we sit down at our table, to get our fuel. Unfortunately, our bodies don't have, does not, do not have a clicker. So we can keep on, when our tank is full, those fat cells are full, all right? We have all the energy we need. We can still keep on eating, all right? And when we eat, just like overflowing your fuel tank, you got a lot of fuel, it's gotta be stored someplace. So our metabolism, okay, with insulin and dipinectin starts filling up, not one cell, another cell, blowing up a hundred times. There's another cell, fills that up a hundred times. Now get another one. You got to keep on filling your tanks up. But guess what? If you keep on overeating, all right, you, you then all of a sudden you've run out of your fat cells are all full. But you can imagine the fat mass is starting to get bigger because you're filling up the, the mass a hundred times. Guess what? You're out of fat. So even when you're a, a child, our fat contains stem cells. Stem mm -hmm. cells can regenerate more fat. So when you keep on eating, all right, uh, what's going to happen? Your body will tap into the stem cells and just make more fuel tanks. Fill that up. Whoops, still, eat, still eating? Now we're going to make another one, one more stem cell. And so these adipose stem cells actually continue to make more fuel tanks. So we can make more and more and more and more fat, all right, even when we're young, okay? This is why if you take a look at childhood obesity, that actually can happen. Uh, different kinds of things are actually uh, influencing uh, body fat, but at the end of the day, this is actually how the fuel works. When your insulin is up, when you're actually eating, okay, um, your metabolism is completely focused on uh, storing the fuel because that's what it's doing. It's supposed to store that fuel for later. Even if you're overeating, it's still going to store it. Now, when you're not eating, your insulin levels go down, right? We know that, okay? And then when your insulin levels go down, your metabolism switches gears, and now it can say, you know what? No more fuel to store. 
let's go start burning some fuel. And so when we're not eating, also called fasting, which happens when we're sleeping every night, when we're not eating, our metabolism switches into fuel burning mode. But over the course of months or years, if you keep on overeating, you're going to actually accumulate a lot of body fat, a lot of extra fuel. And even when you're sleeping and trying to burn that fat, you're not going to actually burn enough of it. Okay. So this is one of the ways that we can actually think about how to optimize our body is to think about the amount of time and how to use our body's natural hardwired fuel burning system in order and, and how to control the amount of food that we eat. So we don't overflow our tank and we give our body enough time to actually uh, burn down that fuel. Wow. Okay. Well, you've given us a lot to digest, I think. So as I think about the whole picture when it comes to our diet then, so let's say we had a healthy foundation and we didn't build a ton of extra fat cells when we were in our childhood years, but now we're adults and we seem, we at least think that we have the symptoms of a slowing metabolism. I personally have not noticed a real slowdown, but what I'm coming to terms with and reading your book is that my activity level definitely shifted when I started working from home and then shifted again when I had two young children at home. And so, you know, you might perceive yourself to be expending the same number of calories, but really not be doing some of the same things. So what do you think we can learn from this and how we can kind of turn on this brown Oedipus tissue, this brown fat that we learn about reading your book? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, you bring up such an important point, which is that when we kind of like get further in our life journey, life happens. Mm -hmm. um, we get busy, we get distracted, we get stressed out, whether it's family stress, emotional stress, financial stress, work stress, you know, we all, I mean, this is modern society we live in. All those things affect um, how we eat, the decision, the choices we eat, how much we exercise, how physically active we are, how much sleep we get. And stress itself, by the way, causes inflammation, uh, which can actually impact our metabolism as well. So um, not surprisingly, as we kind of get into our uh, later years and kind of mid, mid to life, um, you know, it, it's sort of a lifestyle issue that um, tends to sit on our metabolism. But that's actually giving us, that actually gives us the agency to be able to deliberately look at those pieces of our life that we can improve. Um, by the way, exercise, of course, is a good thing. You're, you're burning the fuel, burning the calories, you're burning the fuel, but you don't have to get a trainer and work out at the gym if you don't want to. You don't have to train for a marathon. Some people do that, and that's great, but not everybody needs to. It turns out that if you just spend 30, day, 30 minutes every day Staying, doing something physically active. It could even be walking around your house or walking up and down stairs or going for a walk after dinner. You know, anything that's regular that requires physical activity, you don't have to break into a sweat. You are actually burning fuel. If you think about that, it makes a lot of sense. If you take your car out for a spin, you're burning fuel. And that's what we need to be able to do at the very minimum. And when we're tired and exhausted and at the end of our day and end of our wits, and all we want to do is sit down and veg and maybe have some <laughs> snacks, you know what? I mean, think about it. Like that's so common. Yeah. Happens to all of us. And yet, so it's being mindful about phase, but doing, being physically active. By the way, one of the things I read in my book that I th thought was so interesting is that Yes, working out, exercising is good for you, but it turns out researchers have even looked at fidgeting, you mm -hmm. know, the shaky the leg, thump, 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 tapping your thing. Even <laughs> fidgeting actually burns fuel. So stay, even, even that amount of activity, and that's my point is that you don't have to be an acrobat, you know, you don't have to be a marathon or an Ironman person to training for that in order to be able to really burn fuel. Even small movements actually count. And, and so, the, so that's one thing. Um, I think that the other issue I want to address before talking about what to eat is actually um, stress management is also very, very important because when we're highly stressed out, uh, our, we're overworked, our metabolism actually thrown uh, off of whack as well. It, it just kind of derails our metabolism. And in my book, one of the things I write about that's so interesting is that repressed anger, which a lot of people have, frustration and anger derails our metabolism. In fact, studies have been done showing that, you know, in, in groups of women, that those women um, who have a lot of repressed anger, 
actually have more difficulty managing their body weight. So again, mindfulness, you know, see a therapist, meditate, yoga, get together with friends, managing our stress can also help your metabolism. But let's talk about eating because I think that's something that we do have the agency three times a day to make some decisions on. First, already, I, you know, we talked about this. Don't overeat. If you overeat, you're just going to need to make more fuel tanks, more uh, fuel tanks in order to be able to store that fuel. Don't do it. All right. Um, uh, never goes for seconds. Uh, quit the clean plate club. Be very careful about how much you take. That's just a volume thing. Second, remember I told you that when you're, um, uh, when you're not eating, your body's burning fuel. So one of the really cool practical ways for anybody, no matter where you are in your life, to really burn a little extra fuel, burn down fat, okay, is actually to uh, try to get as much time you're not eating as possible. So here's how it works. If you go to bed for eight hours, which is what you should try to do, eight hours of sleep is a kind of a basically an optimal amount of sleep for your metabolism, your brain, brain health, uh, uh, your immune system. Let's say you go to bed at 11 and you get up at seven in the morning. Now, that, that's fat burning time because you're not eating. When you eat, let's say you eat dinner at seven o'clock the night before and you finished eating, eating dinner at eight, you put the dishes away at eight o'clock. Now, a lot of people actually will snack later at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, maybe a bedtime snack, open the fridge, sneak an extra slice of whatever. All right. The moment you do that, you put in insulin up and now you're not burning fat anymore. So what I do is I basically say, when I put my dishes in the sink, I'm done eating. I'm not going to eat anything afterwards. I'm not going to snack and I'm going to have a bedtime snack. And what I've done, if I eat at seven and I stop eating at eight, put the dishes away at eight o'clock and I go to bed at 11, I've just gained three extra hours of fat burning time, fuel burning time. That's eight hours overnight, three hours after dinner, just when the sink go, when the dishes go in the sink, I don't eat anymore. And then when I get up in the morning, I don't do what my mom used to tell me to do. Get up, hurry up and eat breakfast, catch the school bus and get to school on time. We're adults. So when I get up in the morning, I actually take my time to get ready, take a shower, I get dressed. Uh, I might uh, check my email. I might go for a walk. I do something else, all right, uh, before I eat breakfast. So I usually wait about an hour to take my time and before I put anything in my, before I break my fast and change my metabolism back to fuel storing mode. Guess what? Now I've gained an extra hour. So just add up, do the math. Three hours after dinner, after the sink, uh, food, the dishes go in the sink, eight hours overnight, that's 11 hours, add one more hour in the morning, it's 12 hours of fat burning, fuel burning time, 12 hours, half the day. I've spent 50% of my existence burning down fuel and still pretty reasonably. I ate normal, I mean, I ate breakfast and I ate dinner in normal ways and I don't eat too much. That without actually having to think too much about it is one way to use your body to help you get that operating system to do what it wants to do. You want to take it to the next level you asked about brown fat? Okay. Let's talk about it. Eating ultra processed foods, lots of saturated fat, um, uh, overloading and growing your fat cells, okay, uh, 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 artificial preservatives, artificial sweeteners, artificial coloring, artificial flavoring. All those things derail, cause inflammation, derail our metabolism. And guess what? When our metabolism is derailed, we start to gain extra body fat. All right. And what happens at that point is um, our health starts to go. We start. Um, losing our ability to burn fuel. We just start to store extra fuel. We don't know where we are, all right? Mm -hmm. And so on the other hand, if you choose wisely, and I write about 150 foods in my book um, that actually have been shown in a lab and in clinical studies to help you burn body fat by activating brown fat on one hand. Number two, by preventing the formation of more fat or slowing down the loading up of fuel in your tiny little adipocytes, your fat cells, slow down the load of the fuel, okay? And in some cases, even redirect the stem cells instead of copy pasting and making another fat cell, fuel cell, white fat cell, oh, it's gonna make a brown fat cell instead. Now, what is brown fat? Brown fat is this surprising feature of fat that we haven't talked about yet. Turns out the special, you know, there's, there's two colors of fat in our body, white fat and brown fat. White fat, is the wiggly jiggly stuff. It's under your arm, under your chin. Uh, it's, it's the muffin top, 
So on your thighs and your butt. Okay. Most people don't want too much of, of, of that kind of subcutaneous under the skin white fat. Um, and white fat is also, uh, so you can see that part. White fat is also the kind you can't see, lumpy, bumpy, wiggly, jiggly, except it's found inside the tube of your body. All right. And that kind of fat is very dangerous. It's called visceral fat. Visceral means gut. Gut fat is like a baseball glove that wraps around your organ. And when you've got too much of it, it chokes your organs. Okay. And it's very, very inflamed, very dangerous. Even skinny people can actually have visceral fat that can cause inflammation and cause disease. You can haywire, you can cause your metabolism to go haywire. That's white fat. A little bit good, just the right amount, good, normal, good, too much, bad bad in almost every single way because it derails your metabolism. I'm not talking about vanity. You know, that's a different conversation to have. You know, um, everyone has their own taste of what the body shape and body, body, um, uh, how, how it looks. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm talking as a doctor and as a scientist, I'm talking about the fact that when you have excess body fat, you actually derail your metabolism. However, it turns out, even though your metabolism is hardwired to not burn fuel, when you're eating. There are ways of actually getting around that to burn fuel even when you're eating. And that is actually to activate brown fat. Brown fat's the other color. Brown fat is not wiggly jiggly. You can't <laughs> see it. Brown fat is paper thin. It's crazy. It's paper thin and it's not subcutaneous. So you can't see it. It is close to the bone. So where's brown fat located? It's pressed along your neck. It's behind your breastbone. It's under your arms, like a bra strap, a little bit behind your back, a little bit in your belly. And brown fat, when you eat certain foods, can actually light up, ignite like a, like a space heater. Okay, and I like to give a demo like this. This is actually a lighter. Look at this, check this out. Boom. Okay, that's your brown fat. All right, it is burning. You can turn it on with cold temperatures. You'll ignite it to stay warm, but it will also turn on if you eat certain kinds of foods, mushrooms, broccoli, brassica, broccoli, bok choy, Swiss chard, cauliflower, lights up brown fat, mushrooms light it up, chili peppers light it up, white beans, lentils, capers, all have been discovered to light up your brown fat, which is really remarkable. Tomatoes, whole tomatoes, tomato paste will light up your brown fat. Omega-3 fatty acids will light up your brown fat, which is quite remarkable, you know, and, and this is actually how you can use good fat, brown fat to fight bad fat, which excess bad fat, which is white fat. Now I showed you this, this is, this is burning fuel. Where's the brown fat drawing the fuel from? It's sucking up the fuel, just like on your, uh, on your gas stovetop. When you click whoosh, all right, now you're going to boil some water. That fuel was coming from someplace. Your brown fat draws that extra fuel to create that space heater function from your white fat. It starts to burn down that fuel and foods can activate that process, which is really cool because most people think when it comes to metabolism and body fat, the last thing you would do is to eat foods to activate your metabolism and get rid of fat. But here for the first time I'm at your writing, you can actually love your food to love your metabolism to burn down harmful body fat. Wow. Now you do also put some lists of the foods that you can eat to activate these things within your work. And I find myself also thinking about that Mediterranean diet that you've kind mm. of coined as this amalgamation of both kind of Asian cuisine and kind of these Mediterranean ways of eating to help stimulate our body's natural ability to maintain a healthy metabolism and a healthy weight. But I'm also really finding that a lot of what the recommendations stem around come back to foods that have a high fiber content that may not have a very high total calorie density. So the nutrition you're getting from each of these foods is it's like packed with micronutrients that we may not be so accustomed to measuring like, okay, protein, fat, carbohydrates is right. like one step beyond that. And we've also learned through talking to you in the past too, about the power of green tea or even components of black coffee as for examples. But one of the things I wanted to make sure that we connect to and get people thinking about is the empty calories that we tend to consume in the day to day. And often they come in liquid form, the wine we drink, the beer we drink, the lattes, the frappuccinos, and then all of those extra things that we may be consuming 
after we put our our uh, plates in the sink at 8 p.m. so that we can actually set ourselves up for success while adding these great things to our diet. So I was hoping you could comment on not only the integration of some of these fabulous foods, but also saying goodbye to perhaps some of our overconsumption of these liquid calorie sources. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's all about balance and about making mindful choices that, you know, you realize I'd rather do something good for me that I enjoy rather than doing something bad for me that I might enjoy or might not enjoy. Uh, and so let, let's talk about that. You know, the, the, you know, the most commonly consumed beverage in the world uh, has no calories. It's actually water. And this turns out research has shown that water can actually activate brown fat too, which is really kind of interesting, hmm. specifically like cold, like room temperature water or anything colder than room temperature. And we think it's because there are little thermostats inside our stomach that when you actually put water that's colder than our body, the, the, hmm. the thermostats activate. And of course, that's our core body temperature. Like you don't want to be cooling out your core body temperature. So our brown fat lights up. Super simple. No calories. But actually, it actually also makes us feel full. So we're likely less likely to overeat just with water. I'm talking about beverages now because I have a whole chapter on beverages. Second, tea. Uh, green tea does a lot of things for metabolism, uh, uh, but also actually helps improve your circulation and your immunity and help improve your gut health. Uh, lots of things that green tea uh, uh, actually is beneficial for. If you actually drink it straight, if you start adding other things to your green tea, you know, you start making a you know, the Pacinos that you talked about, anything, <laughs> any kind of like something you drive through and order it, um, the matcha chinos or whatever. Once you start adding other things to it, di you know, dairy, other types of artificial, you know, get a shot of flavoring. You know, now you've changed the you've changed the nature of what it is. You've kind of created your own ultra processed food. And of course, that's really, really common. Uh, and I think that what if you look at the cultures like in the Mediterranean and Asia, they tend to drink these beverages pretty straight. Now, green tea is obviously great. Black tea, people used to say, ah, oh, it's fermented. There's not good for you. Turns out black tea activates your metabolism, turns on your brown fat. And even and the blackest of teas that you can possibly get, I can tell you is a tea that most people may not have heard about, but you can order online. It's called Pu'er tea. P-U apostrophe E-R-H. Pu'er a little town in China. That's actually and, what I'm drinking right now. Oh my, I oh my it gosh. Honor I, I, I love poor tea. It, it, it's really smoky and dark. Yeah, um, it is. It, it can replace Asia, your coffee if you're into it. You that's know? right. Ex yeah. Exactly. It's kind of like a, uh, like a chicory, almost like a chicory coffee. Um, uh, it's smoky. And uh, it's actually often consumed in China as a digestive uh, tea or beverage after dinner. Uh, but what's really cool about it is it's actually a fermented tea that actually has its own bacteria, healthy bacteria for the gut. Okay. It's, I think it's called puericillus. Um, it's its own bacteria that it's, that, that's evolved in puer tea. So it's a probiotic tea, good for mm -hmm. your gut health as well, which is really, really cool. So, but don't monkey with it by putting all kinds of other flavorings and other kind of stuff. Look, you know, I, I always think about this when I um, see teenagers lining up at the mall in front of the bubble tea stand. You know, here you have tea and they're and then they're adding all kinds of stuff to it. Look, it tastes great. But now you've actually doctored it and, and added all this other stuff to it that probably or maybe definitely isn't going to be good for your metabolism. And people drink a lot of it. Same deal as coffee. You know, coffee, uh, by the way, is good in tea or the catechins. Uh, EGCG, which activates your metabolism. And coffee's got something called chlorogenic acid. And by the way, organic coffees have about uh, much more, at least 30 times uh, more chlorogenic acid than conventionally grown coffee. Um, and uh, chlorogenic acid turns on your brown fat and also prevents white fat from forming huge globs. And it redirects the white fat to turn into brown fat. So ignites your space heater function. Again, if you want to really drink your coffee, think about how they do it in Italy. You know, they basically take a straight cup of coffee and they drink it. That's how I drink coffee every day. You know, like I, I'll take a straight cup of coffee. You know, there's this tradition where you drive, go to the drive-thru and you look at all the things and what are the holiday 
when does the pumpkin flavor come back? You know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Right. And what you're doing is you're doctoring it up. So I think for the beverages, I call it the Holy Trinity. If you want to activate your metabolism and fight body fat, the Holy Trinity of beverages are water, tea of all kinds and coffee. Mm -hmm. Have it straight. Well, and to your point earlier about the things that you could consume, let's say after 8 p.m., it mm. might be water. It could be an herbal tea. And if you don't mm. have an intense reaction to caffeine, it might be a cup of tea that like a puer or a green tea. Yeah. And these things come with things like catechins that support your overall health. And to your point also in your earlier work, not having coffee with milk because milk itself, dairy milk can create some noxious chemicals when you consume it, when it combines with with caffeine for, or with the coffee, correct? Well, actually what happens, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, the insight, the discovery of what happens when you put dairy into coffee. So not, not milks, but dairy is that the, that dairy has got milk fats. That's what dairy is mm -hmm. from a cow and milk fats, you know, fat forms soap bubbles. So if you were a chemist and you could look under the microscope, you would see that fat would form little soap bubbles whenever you have fat. And what happens when you put dairy in your coffee, okay, cow milk, uh, uh, those little soap bubbles start forming uh, inside your coffee. You can't see it, doesn't look like soap bubbles, but it's there. And what those soap bubbles do is they form little bubbles around the chlorogenic acid and the other mm -hmm. bioactives, the polyphenols. Now, when you drink that coffee, that those sub bubbles don't get absorbed directly uh, into your so you're blocking your ability of absorbing the chlorogenic acid all right most of it doesn't get absorbed in your stomach it, it, most of it goes down the lower part of your gut and you don't actually get the benefit of it so it's not that you get toxins but you miss out on the good stuff quite a lot of it and the more dairy you use the more soap bubbles form the less you're going to actually of the good stuff you're going to absorb well thank you for that clarification now Something else that you mentioned um, within the book is that when you got to the work of recommending all of these dietary changes or looking at eating to beat disease, there was some level of concern that people that read the book might become overweight, but you found that the exact opposite was true and that that's part of what led to this work. Now, I have also noticed the same thing when it came to consuming the right fats. So for instance, you tell people you need to consume more omega-3 and they consume more omega-3 and you get those random calls of people saying, oh, well, you know, I started consuming more and I have some pounds that are just coming off. I don't even really understand why. Now, we might both know that a calorie is not a calorie, but what more might you have to share about this? Well, first of all, you know, again, this, um, uh, we lump together the idea of fats into one collective, not so good for you. But for example, omega-3 fatty acids, yes, they are fatty acids, but they're incredible bioactives, meaning that when we actually consume them in our body, whether in supplement or in natural form, whether in plant form or from marine form, um, and I read about the whole chapter of seafood um, uh, that is, is you know, I, I was quite surprised that that, you know, we used to always think, you have to have really oily fish, mackerel, sardines, anchovies, um, or salmon um, to, to, be, to be healthy. But it turns out that the latest research shows that even not so oily fish that still have some amount of omega-3s actually are enough. You don't need to over, like, you don't need to go like, oh man, I got to go to, oh, do overkill. And mm -hmm. so even cod has omega-3s. And, and so the amount of cod uh, omega-3s actually help you lose body fat and body weight. Now, obviously, if you go the, the more omega-3s you consume, the more you're actually going to activate your body's health defenses, the more you're going to activate your metabolism. But even um, modest amounts, and this is why, like I always tell people, you get intimidated, like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to have that many supplements. Okay, then don't. But like, have have a little. Get started mm -hmm. with it. And you can see that that you're you're going to feel the difference because you're putting a, an active, not just, it's not any fat. You're not putting a stick of butter into your body. You're having <laughs> a fat that actually activates your health defenses. And so, um, so not all fat is fat. Same thing as olive oil. Olive oil is a cooking fat, a, a, a delicious natural cooking fat, still a fat. You know what's in olive oil? Are polyphenols. And those polyphenols come from the olive 
plant itself, the olive fruit. One of them is called hydroxytyrosol, and it's really, really potent. What does hydroxytyrosol do? Guess what? It does this. It activates the, the, the brown fat, the space heater, all over again. And I think that, you know, the reason I'm actually, you know, using this demo is because I think people then will start to associate a, a picture, an image of the space heating function. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of colors and fat. I want people to understand this is the discovery that really allows us to eat foods so that we can take charge of our metabolism. Wow. Well, I will say too that you've separated the book into three primary sections. Mm. And um, within each of these sections, you're helping to outline a plan for people by the time you get to that third part. So it's organized in such a way that I think people can really take a lot of what we've talked about here today, as well as the resources within the book to build a plan that will work for them, that will help support their long-term health. But this also isn't, it's not like a standard diet book. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how else to put it. It's, um, you know, where your first book, Eat to Beat Disease, in this category was really focused on helping people understand the nutrition that they could get from each of these foods. This one helps people get to the plan. So you have um, sample meal guides and recipes, finding your own way, making it their own, how to ultimately optimize your own metabolism. So taking all of these pieces and integrating them together. So I know we're really at the close of our hour here today. So I wanted to offer you the opportunity to leave our audience with a closing thought or two, what you would have them take away and ultimately understand that they will get from spending the time with your book. Yeah. Look, I mean, the, the great discovery that's been made about human metabolism is that we can actually control it. And our body's hardwired. Our operating system wants to do its thing. And we can actually live our entire human lifespan in really, really good health. And even if no matter where you are in your journey, you can actually make some subtle moves, some easy moves with the timing of what you eat, when you start eating, opening your window for eating, and when you close your window for eating, and then choosing while you're eating what types of foods you should you you prefer. I call it I call my style Mediterranean because I'm Asian. I grew up eating Asian food. Um, I lived in Asia. I've also lived in the Mediterranean. And who doesn't like, you know, Mediterranean or Asian food? My point is the way that I eat is really to lean into my food and eat delicious foods that I like. I put 150 different foods uh, that are all supported by both research and clinical studies, human studies. And I put the dose that you need to eat too, that research has shown how much we, you need to eat. Guess what? The doses are all very reasonable. They're things that they're the, they're the amounts that we would normally want to eat um, uh, for, for if you're eating for health and when you're eating for pleasure. For me, food, um, you know, it's time to rediscover our joy of food, not to fear it. If you care about lo lowering your body fat, you want to fight and lose some weight. But very importantly, if you want to increase your metabolism, fighting body fat ups your metabolism, more metabolism, more energy, more energy, more vibrancy. That's what we want across our whole lifespan. I put recipes in there, 36 recipes. I cook those recipes in my own kitchen. I'm sharing my way of doing it with you. But I emphasize, at the end of the day, you've got to tailor this for yourself. That's how I practice medicine. That's how I practice, you know, my think, my approach to, and coaching for um, healthy eating. Every individual is different. It's all about you and how your body is actually wired. But we can all do it. That's awesome. Now, I know you also have some resources that you offer beyond this book. I've taken one of your courses as a, for example, which was led over the course of four weeks and had the opportunity to interface with you directly for that. I also know that you do a free masterclass. So what more would you like to share with our audience about the ways that they can engage with you and if they want to learn more, um, how they can go about that? Yeah. I mean, I, listen, my research, the work that I do is like sitting in front of a fire hydrant and it's <laughs> gushing out information at me. And, and yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's incredible. And a lot of it's thrilling for me. It's a lot of fun because I'm trained as a scientist and I try to curate it. And so, but I didn't try to get it out. I try to get it out to the public. That's part of my mission. So if you want to learn what I'm learning and how I actually want to make it available for people to share in the upside of the discoveries of science, come to my website. It's Dr. Dr. William Lee, L-I, Dr. William Lee, 
drdrwilliamlee.com. Follow me on social. My handle is at Dr. Dr. William Lee, L I, at Dr. William Lee. You can follow me on uh, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, Twitter. I'm, I'm on all of these things. And what you're going to find is I'm just giving away little bits of information because, you know, I, listen, I've been involved with the biotechnology, you know, developing treatments for cancer and blindness and diabetes. The reality is drug development is very hard. We don't want everyone to have to be on a medicine, to be honest with you. It's not equitable. Not everyone can get the medicines, even the people that need it. But food is the ultimate fair way of actually not just treating disease, but actually improving our health. That is right there, right in front of us. My mission is to get it out to you. So see, come to my website, sign up for a free newsletter, come to my master classes. They're free. And, you know, for people who want to do a deep dive, I actually do mini courses. I do month long courses as Karina, you've actually taken. And look, it's, it's all about, you know, being human and part of being human is sharing. That's what I want to do for your, for everyone. Well, thank you so much again for coming and spending this time with me today. I've so enjoyed it. I look forward to completing your book. I didn't get through the recipes yet. I've had it on my iPad and kind of furiously going through it, but really an incredible work. I learned a thing or two that I didn't expect and the mind blown moments about how I can activate the brown Oedipus tissue to ultimately support my long-term health and turn on the, the engine within is just so useful. I'm putting it into action and I just want to personally thank you for the work. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Wow. What an absolute treat to once again have the opportunity to sit with Dr. William Lee and cover his important work with all of you. Now, I want to say one thing as we prepare to wrap this show. I don't always cover health topics on Care More Be Better, but this is what I do for a living. And I have to say, there are very few individuals who I've come across in my time working in the natural products industry that I feel really get nutrition on a core rudimentary level, who understand not only the whole picture of treating the person, but also the reality of what it is to live in today's world. So I really want to caution all of you to say it's important to read great works like this right there eat to beat your diet. Now, I loved his first book on this very subject, Eat to Beat Disease. This book even makes it more clear. So I hope that you'll go out and get a copy of it today because it's available as of yesterday. With that being said, Care More, Be Better, this show is an invitation to care more so we can all be better. And if we can't care more about the things that we put in our diet, about our personal healths, about our longevity, then what are we really here for in the first place? I encourage you all to follow Dr. William Lee on all of his platforms. He's very active on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. He gives fantastic information for free all of the time. And you can follow his efforts by going to his website too. As we stated before, drwilliamlee.com. That's drwilliamli.com. As always, if you have questions for myself or for Dr. Lee, you can reach out to me directly, either on social channels or by sending me an email note to hello at caremorebebetter.com. And for those of you that really want to deep dive into his work, I encourage you to go find my other podcast show, Nutrition Without Compromise. Go back to my very first interview with Dr. Lee and then follow the next four week series where I took his course, offered feedback, a download from each week's experience, and ultimately gave you a snapshot that you wouldn't otherwise easily see. Thank you listeners now and always for being a part of this community because together we really can do so much more. We can care more. We can be better. We can even regenerate our entire health system, your body, your longevity, and we can solve global problems together. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good. 